I have always considered myself to have a non-traditional background for a professor. I don't come from a long line of academics. I began my own academic journey by attending community college classes at night after finishing my day job as a restaurant manager. From there, I worked my way through undergraduate and graduate studies in psychology. I always loved being on campus and being part of a university community, but I did feel out of place at times. For one thing, I am a Native American scientist coming from the Navajo, Diné, and Hopi nations in Northern Arizona. In the U.S., only about 1% of college students and less than 1% of college professors are Native Americans. So I typically found myself to be the only Native person in the classroom or in the lab. And when I st first started my job as a professor, I felt like everyone else knew how to fit into this academic life more than I did. From these experiences, I am working to discover changes that individuals and institutions can make to create an academic climate and culture that feels welcoming and inclusive to everyone, and in which people from many different backgrounds can do their best work and make their own discoveries. I hope my research can be used to develop and inform initiatives that will help the university be a place where everyone, including non-traditional students, faculty, and staff, can thrive. My name is Denise Sikakoptua, and I am a University Diversity and Social Transformation Professor of Psychology at the University of Michigan. In my work on inclusive academic environments, I study environmental cues, which are things in the environment that can influence people's sense of whether they fit in. These cues can include physical objects, such as pictorial representations of who is seen as successful and valued in this field, and also the diversity amongst the people present and the things that those people say and do. These cues are important because they communicate a critical and sometimes unwelcoming message to people with backgrounds and identities that are different from the majority. As an experimental social psychologist, I examine these issues using the scientific method of randomly assigning people to experience these environmental cues or not, to be able to establish a causal link between the cues and people's outcomes. In one line of research, I have studied the experience of people who, like I did, found themselves to be the only person of their race present in a group, a situation I call solo status. In these studies, we randomly assigned African-American and white college students to learn and be tested on academic material in a laboratory setting, in groups in which they were the only person of their race or not. We found that not only were African-American students more likely to report greater anxiety about possibly performing poorly when they were the solo black student, but that this anxiety also led them to actually perform more poorly when tested on the material. A similar pattern of results also emerged among white women who were tested as the solo woman in an all-male group, a situation that was particularly damaging to women's performance in mathematics, where they are negatively stereotyped compared to men. These studies showed that the academic performance of students from underrepresented groups, such as racial minority students and women in math, is actually harmed by a lack of diversity that makes them stand out uncomfortably in terms of race or gender. More diverse settings, where people can see others like themselves, allows minority people to perform at their full potential. I was proud when this work was submitted as research evidence considered by the United States Supreme Court in support of the university's race-conscious admissions policies. Of course, people are not only affected by the types of people they see or don't see around them, but are also influenced by what those people say and do that could reflect stereotyping. My research team has focused directly on climate issues by investigating the consequences of witnessing bias in the interpersonal interactions they see around them, compared to what could happen if one witnessed interactions counteracting the stereotype instead. In these studies, we developed two videos, one showing examples of gender stereotyping in student teams working on an engineering project such as women being assumed to play secretarial roles like a note taker and speaking less, and men being assumed to be the technical experts and speaking more. A second video showed a counter stereotype with the women in the group taking on more visible technical roles. We found that when students saw the gender stereotyping video, women later participated less in their own engineering group project team than men. 
but when students saw the counter-stereotyping video, women and men participated equally on their own project. Our work experimentally demonstrated that when people witness stereotyping around them, it can promote them falling into gender stereotypic roles themselves, thus perpetuating the stereotype. But when people witness behavior that counteracts the stereotype, both women's and men's behaviors change to become more gender equal. Although studying how environmental cues can create unwelcoming environments is important, it's just a start. In order to support institutional change, we must leverage what we learn from social science research to support evidence-based interventions that can create more welcoming and inclusive environments for everyone. One great example of using research to support institutional change is the programming offered by the ADVANCE program at Michigan. I worked for several years with ADVANCE as a facilitator for their faculty recruitment workshop, which is offered to faculty hiring committees. It is one effort among several to facilitate recruitment, retention, climate, and leadership among faculty from groups underrepresented in the academy. In this workshop, we taught hiring committees about social science research evidence of hiring biases and how to conduct the search differently in order to reduce the influence of such biases and create a more equitable faculty hiring process. Of course, being a researcher, I can't help but collect data. So I conducted a study with faculty, which demonstrated the effectiveness of attending the workshop in promoting positive attitudes about faculty diversity and endorsing changes in faculty hiring processes that are based on sound research evidence. Regarding students, I served as associate chair for diversity in my home department of psychology. In this role, I managed efforts to promote diversity among our graduate students and create a positive climate that increases their retention and success. Our approach was that change emerges through actions, not just words, and that diversity is everyone's issue that we should all be working on together. We offer a diversity recruitment weekend aimed at students from underrepresented groups, and also created ways to acknowledge through awards the diversity-related research and service that our graduate students engage in. Our department has been recognized by national societies for excellence in recruitment and retention of diverse graduate students and we are seen as a model for other departments who also seek to achieve these goals. Large-scale institutional change is important, but also important are the changes that we as individuals can make. On the individual level, I've worked to ensure that I incorporate practices based on research evidence into my curricula and teaching. For example, previous work has shown the power of role models to benefit students from underrepresented groups. One of my own studies showed that exposing female science majors to female science role models decreased their feelings of stereotype threat and concern about being stereotyped, which can improve women's outcomes. Therefore, I include and highlight the contributions to my field from people of color and women researchers and scholars. When I am describing their work in my classes, I highlight their social identities, even showing pictures of these researchers on my lecture slides. This benefits students from underrepresented groups who may see possible futures for themselves as researchers. And it benefits all students who get the chance to learn about the many contributions of diverse scholars to the field of psychology. I also advocate for the inclusion of photography and art in academic spaces that highlights diversity and signals that all types of people can succeed in this setting. I think these are smaller scale but valuable actions that many of us could easily do. Social scientists have been studying issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and social transformation for decades, providing us with a strong basis of evidence that can inform the large and small actions we take to improve our academic environments. When our environments support creative people in diverse teams, we see better outcomes, more knowledge creation, greater innovation, more progress within our own fields and in society itself. This is because environments that signal that all types of people are welcomed and valued allow people to achieve their maximum potential without being held back by stereotypes that inhibit the expression of their ability in their performance. Moving forward, I hope people will ask themselves, what individual actions can I take to signal that all people are equally valued in my environment? How can I support and participate in larger scale strategies to create more positive institutional change? Looking back to my experiences as a non-traditional person in academia, I see that although I had concerns about not fitting in, 
I truly benefited from the large and small actions of others that communicated to me that I belong here. Together, we could do that for everyone.